Good morning and welcome to the 100th annual meeting of the American Council of Learned Societies, which is actually because governance at ACLS is always charmingly complicated. The 102nd meeting of the council and the 98th of the corporation. <laughs> it is fitting that we meet in New York City um, where our very first meeting took place in 1920. Today is the last of my 16 reports to the council and I'll be speaking about our work of the last year, but perhaps because I've been thinking more and more about the study of Chinese poetry into whose waters my toes have only occasionally dipped in recent decades, and because my chair, our chair, Bill Kirby, has already set the glorious example of what texts one should quote when one is speaking, I will open by quoting another passage from the Analects in which Confucius describes his pedagogical philosophy. Quote, I never enlighten anyone who has not been driven to distraction by trying to understand a difficulty or who has not got into a frenzy trying to put his ideas into words. When I've pointed out one corner of a square to anyone and he does not come back with the other three, I will not point it out to him again. The value of reticence as challenge to a student or reader was to characterize much of the Chinese literary tradition. Many of the 305 poems, known as the Book of Songs, that Confucius exhorted his students to study, for example, provide hints as to what they're about and who the speaker is, a woman being sent into a marriage she doesn't want, a soldier praising the valor of his commander, or a citizen complaining about the depredations of his ruler. But these were only hints. Poetry provided readers the opportunity and the obligation to fill in the missing corners, and it was this active work of the mind that Confucius insisted on, and uh, exegetes over the centuries responded uh, in force. It meant that readers would always have something to do. I'd like to suggest that this call for an active and imaginative hermeneutics for readers who complete the square before them has in many ways always been the work of this council. You who are assembled here today represent a good cross-section of the ACLS community on whom we depend for this engagement. My colleagues on the staff of ACLS, the more than 600 reviewers and panelists who participate in fellowship selection, institutional leaders, fellows, funders who have supported our work, executive uh, directors of societies, delegates, board members, and many other friends. Thank you for being here. It's great to have you. Much of our collective work in completing the picture before us is in fact about reading. Reading the more than 3,500 fellowship applications that we receive in our 14 fellowship programs. Many of you have helped us do that work, so you know well the iterative process of working through a tranche of proposals, which may drive you to distraction, if not frenzy. Sometimes one begins with a fear that they're all just too good and it won't be possible to differentiate among them. But soon enough, patterns and rankings become apparent, if not on the first run through, then surely by the second or third. Weighing a scholar's proposal in some ways requires providing the missing corners of a picture. Can this person finish this project? Will the project have resonance? We're making a series of bets, of investments, but more than anything, doing so is an interpretive act of imagining the completion of what one has read. And I'm very happy to report that in 2019, we expect to award a record $25 million that will enable individual scholars and other grantees to complete their work. You'll hear about this and more from Matthew Goldfeder. This year, my colleagues also launched two new initiatives, both designed in partnership with and funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. The first of these, led by Rachel Bernard, supports the research of individuals whose primary academic affiliation is a community college. The awardees have yet to be announced, but the applicants came to us from 117 different institutions. And as many of you know, this is but the tip of a very large iceberg, since there are over 1,100 community colleges in the country which, uh, where the lion's share of students are studying the humanities. When we launch a new program, we're ready for anything, but we are ready mostly to learn and refine what we do. We anticipated that we would receive a variety of proposals, and we did, from traditional research topics to projects that involved students and local communities, 
completing the picture of our program in unanticipated ways. The list of 26 awardees will be announced shortly, and then we'll open the call for next year's competition, expecting, as always, to learn as we go. Our second new program, Scholars in Society, directed by John Paul Christie, enables faculty who teach and advise PhD students to conduct research projects while in residence at cultural, media, government, policy, or community organizations of their choice. We're postulating that as they complete a picture of their scholarly work outside of the academy's walls and bring their research into public engagement, they can take that experience back into their work on campus of shaping curricula and guiding graduate students. That there might be some fundamental connection between the external world and the world of humanistic expression is, by the way, a well-known assumption of a preface to the Book of Songs, which posits a direct correlation between the two and also tells us that, quote, for correcting successes and failures, for arousing heaven and earth, and for moving ghosts and spirits, nothing surpasses poetry. Now, to be sure, not all of the scholars who are being embedded in organizations ranging from the Skid Row History Museum and Archive in Los Angeles to the Cambridge City Council are poets. But there's no question that they are engaging with issues of great human and societal import. Their work will include, for example, a study that illuminates the lived experience of detained migrants in the United States and a partnership with the Utah AIDS Foundation to chronicle the challenges that faced the few people who were willing to treat the disease in the state in the 1980s and 90s. In addition to coming together to review proposals and programs like these, the communities we mobilize also undertake the worldly work of envisioning and implementing organizational change. In the past year, we've engaged with scholars who are helping to define significant institutional priorities, practices, and norms that undergird scholarship, and I'll provide four examples. First, we're delighted to report that thanks to a generous grant in honor of our centennial from the Carnegie Corporation, the ACLS African Humanities Program, which under Andrzej Tomowski's directorship has supported the work of 400 humanists in universities in Gonza, Nigeria, South Africa, Tanzania, and Uganda for a decade will continue for three more years. My colleagues who attended the program's regional congress in uh, Dar es Salaam in January report that while there was much jubilation about the $5 million Carnegie grant, there was no resting easy at the good news. A steering committee of the African scholars supported by the program is thus deeply engaged in strategic discussions about how to best maintain momentum after the funding runs out. Having taken a page from our own experience about the value of professional societies, they're considering what sort of association will be the optimal vehicle for sustaining the infrastructure for African humanistic scholarship for which many years of Carnegie support has dramatic have uh, dramatically laid the foundation. Second, the leaders of our societies gathering together in November spent a lot of time in collaborative work focused on how associations can support their members during a time of ever greater awareness of the profound challenges associ associated with sexual harassment and sexual assault. As you all know, societies host meetings and honor members with prizes and awards but in recent years, they've had to give much more serious consideration to how the behavior and misbehavior of members can no longer be viewed as tangential to their place in their community. As a consequence, society leaders have become deeply engaged with how their organizational policies not only can respond to complaints and concerns, but also can create the best environment for equity and inclusion in the first place. These are down-to-earth questions to work on, but ones that obviously have central importance for all members of the societies and for our community as a whole. Third, we've been pleased to empower the fruits of research to enrich a broader public understanding through programs like the Loose ACLS program in religion, journalism, and international affairs, which is building durable connections between humanistic scholarship and the media through individual fellowships, institutional grants, workshops, and media training. A recent meeting at Arizona State University, led by Valerie Popp, 
convened scholars of religion, learned society leaders, and journalists from outlets like the Washington Post, NPR, and CBS News to consider how best to promote collaboration, mutual understanding, and more thoughtful, balanced coverage of religion's complex roles in society. And a final example of ACLS's work in the past year that aims to support institutional imperatives and thereby foster the scholarship of tomorrow was our reshaping of a Mellon-supported postdoctoral partnership initiative. This was a legacy of our new faculty fellows program, which was designed with Mellon funding in 2008 to support early career scholars facing the post-recession jobless market, and it ran for four years. Both the foundation and ACLS have been curious over the years about whether and how the humanities postdoc as an animal has been most effective and for whom. Research on these programs presents some challenges since neither the fellows nor the departments and centers that host them are likely to complain. So we were happy to take inspiration from successful efforts at the University of Chicago to pro provide two-year fellowships to scholars from underrepresented minority groups with the intention of co converting the fellowships into tenure-track positions. We focused the remaining postdoc funds that were, we were awarded by Mellon toward that end and we'll hope thereby to contribute to the broadly shared institutional priority of diversifying the professoriate. At their meeting tomorrow, the leaders of our learned societies will be addressing topics both, both recent and perennial, like professional codes of conduct and challenges to journal publication, with an optional deep dive into fundraising. It won't surprise you to learn that a great deal of my time this past year has been spent working the quiet phase of our centennial campaign that was just announced yesterday. All I can say is that this has been truly exhilarating to be able to work with grateful fellows, visionary foundations, and generous friends who endorse our commitment to stewarding and championing the, humani championing the humanities. Under the able guidance of our new director of philanthropy, Mary Richter, we're more than halfway toward our $125 million goal, which aims to strengthen the core of our fellowship support, extend the reach of all of our programs, and increase our organizational capacity. And I'm very happy to thank all of you who have been and will, I hope, choose to become participants in that effort. It's been a pleasure to welcome Mary to ACLS. Um, she's one of several new staff whose energy animates everything we do. I want to express my gratitude to two people who have welcomed me to ACLS and whose efforts have been uh, especially important uh, in this centennial year. Uh, Steve Wheatley, uh, Vice President for 15 of the past 16 um, years, uh, who was recalled to service and has been central to all things centennial, and uh, especially the publication, and Sandra Bradley, without whom nothing in these days would happen. Uh, <laughs> Steve and Sandra. But I must report the bittersweet news that two of our longest serving employees, who were also there when I started, will be leading my way into retirement over the next few weeks. Candace Freed, who's been with us for 33 years, will start her much earned next adventure on May 1st. Her current title is Director of Web and Information Systems, but her responsibilities have embraced publication, communication, design, and IT, pretty much all at the same time. She's managed with great attentiveness the look of ACLS, from photos at these meetings, some call her Candid Candace, to our website, style sheet, and brand. And she'll be followed a month later by Cindy Muller, who perhaps more than anyone else has been the voice of ACLS to our fellows since 2002, on the phone in the early years, and now, of course, mostly by email. As manager of fellowships and public programs, Cindy has been chief shepherd and handholder to anxious applicants and referees, and lead negotiator with institutions ensuring that our awardees actually get paid. Pretty important work. We lose half a century of institutional expertise and an immeasurable amount of dedication and goodwill with these two departures. And I hope Cindy and Candace are in the room so we can thank them for everything they've done.
So let me move to a conclusion by recalling the two modes of activities in which ACLS has been engaged. The reading that enables judgments about scholarly merit and the consideration of worldly organizational issues that is needed to uphold or update the structures that support scholarship. Are they wildly different from each other? Is one undertaking more important than the other? To the classical Chinese, poetry, and indeed all humanistic pursuits did not provoke an either or quandary about ideas versus worldly concerns. Poetic composition was a skill any bureaucrat would be expected to master and display, and writing poetry was an important currency of personal, social, and political exchange. I think that we can celebrate the fact that the work of the humanities is about the deep scholarly engagement with the evidence of a painting, a text, the structure of an idea, or language, or culture, without undervaluing the need to manage our bureaucratic structures and public engagements as well. We'll hear this evening from the historian Lynn Hunt, who throughout her career has listened to and engaged deeply with evidence concerning how people lived, what they believed, and how their views created the history around them. She drinks deeply of scholarship, but she also, and I won't steal her punchlines, engages with the world. The work of ACLS this year has done both. It is the pleasure, as Bill reminded us yesterday, of putting our learning into practice. 14 years ago, I began my report to this council by citing not a Chinese poem, but this one by Emily Dickinson. I step from plank to plank, a slow and cautious way. The stars about my head I felt, about my feet the sea. I knew not but the next would be my final inch. This gave me that precarious gait, some call experience. I'll note, by the way, that I had encountered this poem in a New York City subway train, <laughs> where the MTA had embarked on a program to put poetry in motion, confirming that the humanities do have a public. Those of you who are familiar with my various orthopedic afflictions over the recent past know that my gait is even more precarious now than it used to be. But I'd like to thank all of you who have helped to keep me upright as I've stepped from plank to plank over the past 16 years. Working with this council has been an extraordinary pleasure and an honor. Your astonishing range of passions, commitments, and approaches to scholarship in the world have made you wonderful colleagues, teachers, and friends. I've especially appreciated your understanding that the work of ACLS and of the humanities is a job that will never be done, something that countless annual meetings before us haven't concluded as well. And that is why we will persist. Reporting from the 1980, 1948 annual meeting, B.J. Whiting, the delegate from the Medieval Academy, wrote that, quote, there was a pleasantly utopian undertone to this portion of the discussion. Unquote. In the humanities, we're proud to be utopian when it's called for and to be idealists all the time. As Pogo from the comic strip cheerfully proclaimed, we are surrounded by insurmountable opportunities, <laughs> but we also know how to get things done. I'll leave at the end of June hoping to wade more deeply into other waters, confident that Joy Connolly, James Shulman, and my ACLS colleagues our chair, Bill Kirby, and the board, and all of you will be eager to fill in those missing three corners of pictures large and small, puzzles of theory and puzzles of practice, those we know well and others that have yet to appear. And I know that you will do so superbly. Thank you very much.